Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Kimberly Gerber from Accelerate. Kimberly is uh, an executive leadership coach. She's been uh, working with people in uh, various corporations. We're going to talk about the great resignation. We're also going to speak about the characteristic of people that need to be promoted uh, to the executive leadership, which are one, the competence, two, grit, and three, the potential for strong executive presence. Enjoy my conversation with Kimberly. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Business of Meaning podcast. And today I have the great pleasure to speak with Kimberly Gerber. She has had a fantastic career in corporate. She started with Starbucks. She was uh, already COO when she turned 32. And 20 years ago, she started her own company focusing on executive leadership. And at this time and this day and age, when we're talking about the grand resignation and how to motivate your team, I couldn't dream of any anyone better than Kimberly to speak with today. So Kimberly, thank you for taking the time. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, really interesting what's going on. Now. But before we, we, we dig into the those questions, uh, what gets you into executive leadership and what motivates you one day? to say, you know what, I am going to start my own company now? So the first question, what got me interested in executive leadership is as a young person, uh, in early on in my career, I had a couple of unique opportunities. First of all, when I was in grad school, I was, um, you know, had to work to put myself through grad school and I worked for a home care agency. I was quickly promoted to their marketing lead. And then I became the general manager of that company. And then a partner and I started our own home health care firm, grew it to a multi-million dollar business in a matter of a couple months. And, um, and this is while I was in grad school. So I had another ambition. That was not my ambition. However, it gave me a taste early on of being a leader at the highest level, even if it was a very small company, it was still, you know, a couple million dollars. So I then went on to work for Fortune 500 companies. Uh, I, I worked for Fleetwood Enterprises, then I was recruited to Starbucks, and then I was recruited to be the COO for a dot-com company early on in, you know, in the 2000s. And I was in marketing. Marketing is my, my expertise, if you will. That's my educational background, and it's what I, where I was working in corporate. And what I observed was, as a, as a brand strategist, I was always looking for what makes consumers move a certain way, what makes, you know, influences people to purchase certain things. And so my mind is attuned that way. And I started to notice, not on a personal or on a, on a marketing level, but on a personal leadership level, that many of the same principles that work in marketing for consumers also work for people. And what I began to notice was the leaders, and in particular, the executives who really understood fundamentally how to communicate with people that were confident within themselves, um, that cared about the impact that they had, those leaders were very unique, not only in their ability to create results, but to create you know, really, truly raving fan bases within the organization, um, people who organizations would really rally around. And they weren't always, you know, the CEO or the COO or the, the, the upper most people. A lot of times they were the still senior level executives. And I and just kind of for fun, I began to study that. And as I went on in my career, um, I took the the I took a job as a COO for a dot com company, and shortly thereafter, just kind of the world blew up, and it became the dot bomb. And that's something a phrase that yep. you know maybe if you're young you don't remember, but a lot of us do. And during that time, I had a lot of people call out to me and say, "Hey, you're going to be out of a job soon. Do you want to come work for me or help me on a project?" And after about five or six of those phone calls, I decided that I had a company and I launched Accelerate with six clients. I turned my company that I was working for into a client and and the rest is a happy history in that regard. And when I started, a lot of those calls were for marketing support. Uh, but very quickly, I knew that I was really just passionate about helping leaders be their very best. And it's really about helping people who have a lot of impact be their very best because that means that more people 
are going to have better days. That that you know, if leaders if a leader is firing on all cylinders and they're really leading at their highest potential, they're really creating a better experience, a better world for a lot of other people. So that's why I am personally passionate about working with executives. It's awesome. Now I was listening to you and thinking that uh, it's it's always you. It's for who you work rather than for which company uh -huh. uh, you uh -huh. work. And uh, I true. can, like everybody, but uh, I have example of uh, leaders that are, are throwing their own team under the bus just to protect themselves. It's, it's create the, the worst culture ever. Exactly, exactly. So when you have um, the, the role of uh, advising executives and, mm -hmm. and you start your company um, almost 20 years ago now, congratulations. Thank you. What has changed? What have you seen the change uh, with, with the people that you are advising and the style of leadership? Uh, what you've seen and when you started and what you see today? So I think that some of the two changes I'm going to point out, I think are very significant. One is that leadership today is not top-down leadership in organizations. The, the, the amount of opportunities for people to have a voice at all levels of the organization has changed dramatically. And, that, and most of that implication is good. The, the challenge that it brings for leaders is that they really do have to be better communicators. The level of work you could produce and what you would get recognized and rewarded for 20 years ago required a lot less communication finesse than it does today. I think that that's a big shift. And I think it's a positive shift um, because I think that 20 years ago, the discussion around your company culture was novel. Let's build a company culture. Let's have a mission statement. Let's have a vision statement. And it was more of a, of a project than it was the fabric of the organization. And today that's evolved so much. And so I think that that's exciting. I think the other enormous shift, and it's well documented, is the, the, just the generational shift that's happened in the last 20 years. And the importance of it is that the, you've got a lot of younger leaders today in very yeah. high level positions. So 20 years ago, it was less, much less common. It was, again, I'm going to use that word novel. It was novel to see, um, you know, C-level people in, you know, their late thirties, early forties, but today it's very common. So mm -hmm. for folks like myself, 10 years ago, most of my clients were in their fifties. Today, most of my clients are in their early forties and I work with executives. Yeah. And yeah. so that, that's a huge shift. And it's, it's a lot of fun. I could actually go into a rabbit hole here, but I won't, <laughs> but, but it's, it's actually a lot of fun to work with executives who are on that younger side because the energy that they have left, just the vitality that they have and the, the, the runway that they still have changes how they're willing to lead the risks that they're willing to take. So I, I actually like that change as well, but it presents its own challenges. So you, are you saying that uh, they would be ready to take more risks than uh, people 10 years ago? I think so, yes. Interesting. Because also it's more risky. Um, and, and I know you, you're speaking about that, but it's, it's, uh, the, they have more visibility. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah. obviously they, they need to communicate better, but more. Yes. And so they have more risk of even if they don't mean something bad of saying something that can be that, very dangerous yeah what you're speaking to right there um that that actually wasn't what i was i was thinking of i was thinking more of strategic risks and and like okay. you know like how how to move the company and what kind of of um directions they could take the company but but it is interesting you bring up something that is very important And it is a big change is the visibility that we have and the scrutiny that leaders are under. And I talk about, you know, five leadership leaps, leaps that senior leaders make when they're going up into the executive level, C-level roles. And one of them is external leadership. The impact that, especially if it's a, a PE-backed company, a nonprofit organization, or certainly a 
publicly held company, if you, a big misstep in with investor, with Wall Street, with media, with major client, that's that's difficult to recover from today. And the the challenge, and this kind of blends in with the the youth issue, is you've got all these young leaders who just haven't been around long enough to have the depth of experience that maybe leaders at the C-level had in the past. So they've got to figure out how to get up to speed very quickly Mm -hmm. and be able to be nimble and responsive and confident and have excellent executive presence in any environment. It's It's a challenge, but it's rewarding. Definitely. And I was listening to what you're saying and it remind me of what my father used to say is that the, the, <laughs> the proportion of stupid people is the same at every level in every organization. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Can I quote your dad? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, and, and I can help but think about the, this, and I don't have any other words, this idiot who, who fired 900 people on zoom. Oh uh, gosh, last yeah. week. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, how, how can somebody reach such a level of responsibilities and behave like that? I want to say fear. Mm. And and also, that's a person who who did does not surround himself with good, trusting stewards, because leadership gaffes like that, uh, they come from people who are running rogue and who really aren't building good cultures within their organizations. Most organizations that I am experience, even the ones where I I I am. You know, I question the talent of the leadership that <laughs> they still would be prevented from doing something like that. You're, you're, you have a very diplomatic way of putting the things there. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of my gifts. <laughs> uh, you're also uh, talking about the, the struggle that, you know, executive uh, have when they're actually in, in the first 18 months yeah. uh, of their job. And you just mentioned now uh, a few minutes ago, the five leaps from senior mm-hmm. leader to executives. So w- what are those? And, and I think that will interest people that are listening for those that are that look, thinking of promoting internally, but also yep. for themselves. Yes. Yeah. So there's five leaps and you can be an, you could be an excellent senior leader in many dimensions and still you're going to take a leap getting up to the sea level. And the, the interesting thing is, you almost don't know it until you've done it, unless you know you, you're on a, a really good development pathway. The first leap is self leadership. So when you're when you are reporting to another C level or, or you're reporting to someone, all the way down through you know your first job when you're an independent individual contributor, you've got people looking out for you. You've got people telling you, no, you can't do that, or yes, you can do that. When you get up to the sea level, two things fundamentally change. First is you no longer have someone looking over your shoulder, checking in on you every week, even every month. A lot of CEOs are so outwardly focused. They're so tasked with the business of figuring out the business and moving the business forward and and, and, um, connecting externally that they're trusting their sea level people to run the business. So if you don't have good self-leadership, self-awareness, self-confidence, self-regulation, nobody's looking out for you. And if and so if you don't have those things, you can get on the skids really quickly. And why that's so important is because this is my second point is the stress level at the C level is exponentially higher. It doesn't matter what organization you're in especially in today's times, it's exponentially higher at the sea level. And so if you have poor self-regulation, poor self-confidence or poor self-awareness, those stressors are going to get to you quickly and you're going to start making fear-based decisions. Mm. You're going to start reacting. You will leak your stress and you won't have good physical expressions for stress. So self-leadership, super important. Second level of leadership is strategic leadership. Second area, it's not a level, but it's an area. 
again, here it's where it's, it's on you now for your area, your division, and maybe even for the organization, you've got to come up with a strategy for tomorrow. You've got to make sure that the operational strategy that you're working with today aligns throughout the organization. In any role prior to that, unless you had a specific strategy role, which very few people do, chances are you haven't done it for the organization. Yes, you might have put together a strategic plan or a plan that you called strategic, but was it? Uh, my experience is that so many people today do not know the difference between a strategy and a tactic. So this leap is big for a lot of people, understanding what is strategy, what is the strategic process, how do you align an organization to a strategic vision or to a strategic uh, operational plan. It's Those are things that have to be learned. And again, going back to self-confidence and self-awareness, you can be an amazing C-level executive, even a CEO, and not fundamentally be a strategist if you are aware of that and you surround yourself with great people who can help you. Because as an executive, you don't need to be the strategist, but you better darn well have a strategy and be able to speak to it and know why it's a strategy. And that is a big problem for a lot of leaders. They just don't get that. So that's right. number two. Number three, it's the organizational leadership. And this is more of just having not done it before. It's, um, it's a shift in relationship in the organization from going someone who was like a child in the organization taken care of to being someone who is now a parent in the organization. Like the sales uh, executive who's becoming director of sales? Uh, no, that's still not. It would be more like the um, VP of sales becoming the chief commercial officer. Okay. It's it's like, right, it's the big leap. And so the before you were, you you received the, you know, hey, here's what the culture is going to be. Here's what the, uh, the guiding values are going to be. Here's what our, um, our people hiring process and philosophies and all of that stuff. And you're executing. Now, when you get up to the C-level, you're actually creating, you're mm. deciding what is going to be, what are going to be the policies and procedures of the organization. And then, and so you've got to think about the organization in a very different way. A lot of people haven't done that before. And so they just miss the boat on that for a long time. Mm -hmm. So that's three. Four is um, executive team leadership. And this is going from where you're the leader and you're building good camaraderie and you're building good productivity with your team and everyone is following your lead to where now at the C level, you're working with A players, hopefully, who are all very competent, usually very, you know, self promoting, and they're going to fight for what they want. And so now you have to bring people together without telling them what to do. You've got to bring people together and have them work in alignment. And it is a different type of leadership. It's a different level. So you can't lead the way you did before. You've got to be much more creative and use systems much differently than you have had to before. And then the other one, the fifth one is what we talked about. It's external leadership, being able to show up under the gun, have executive presence, have the articulate, be able to shoot from the hip and not get your company in trouble. Interesting. So basically what, from everything you're saying, and, and I'm, I'm speaking from the point of view of an entrepreneur, or obviously yeah. doesn't have a large organization and like many of my, my friends and, and listeners have, basically everything you just mentioned, um, you have to do a part of it yourself and find the right person to complement you in your own organization. Nobody does yes. it alone, right? No one does it alone. No. And, you know, it's interesting because speaking to entrepreneurs, they are executives. And so they have to make the leaps too. And though I don't work directly with a lot of entrepreneurs because I'm mostly working in larger organizations, I'm an entrepreneur. I've had tons of clients, you know, through the years I've worked with entrepreneurs here and there. And, and what I would say is that they have to master those leaps too for themselves. Mm -hmm. It, it's it's as though they are they have to know all of that with the exception of maybe the executive team leadership then they they don't necessarily have to know that because they're not doing that but all those other ones they've got to know that they've got to have they have to have navigated those leaps too can, can you be a great people leader and a bad executive or yes. do you need to be a great people leader to be an executive interesting it's interesting 
Of course, it helps a lot to be a great people leader. However, that does not mean you're going to be a great executive. Sometimes, some people leaders build incredible loyal teams and they do a really good job managing. However, they don't have the grit or the executive presence or the potential for those things to succeed at an executive level. And so it's it's sometimes tough. You know, sometimes I'm working with C-level or CEO level people and they want to promote certain folks mm. who cannot make the leap. And this is one of the problems. This is why a lot of times folks, the wrong people get promoted to the executive level because they pick like, oh, it's a great people leader. Mm. And they're and they may be wonderful, but really they don't have what it takes because it takes grit to excel at the highest level. Yeah. You know, think about the difference between, you know, business owners who, you know, entrepreneurs who go into business for themselves, some succeed and some fail. Why? There's reasons for that. At the executive level, it's the same thing. And it doesn't mean that you're a bad leader or a bad person or even made bad choices. It's just like any job, not everybody's cut out for it. The, the challenge with it is, yeah, the Peter principle for some. Now, everyone thinks they want to be executive. Not not everybody, but a lot of people think that they want to be an executive because it's like, I think as humans, we're driven to want to get to the top. Mm. And so yeah. for many people, that seems to be the, the pathway. However, folks would be much happier if they really understood where they were going to excel and be fundamentally fulfilled looking at the whole, I will say, lattice of the organization. Interesting. So if I understand you well, um, a great people leader is not necessarily a great executive, mm -hmm. but do you need to be a great, a, a, does a great executive needs to be a great people leader? I would think to say yes. I think it's easy to say yes. And I would say they have to be excellent communicators and they have to master the ability to get their team working for them. However, I think that we see a lot of executives who are very successful, who people leadership isn't their top thing. So, so I, I would say I wouldn't overlook someone as a senior leader. I wouldn't overlook someone who wasn't an amazing people leader if they met all of the other dimensions. However, I would make sure they were supported. Right. Yeah. It, it, you also don't want to hire a jerk. No. You don't want to promote a jerk because you're always looking at what is the echo effect of that person. What is their impact going to be? So I, I think that it is it's one of those fine lines. They have to be a decent people leader. So how do you identify characteristic in people that needs to be promoted or that should be promoted? So I, when, I, when I'm working with my clients, I guide them to look for three things. One is competence. It's, it's competence in the job that they've been tasked for up to date. Are they reliable? Do they seek to grow their expertise in their area? Are they open to feedback? Is their, is their competence already an A plus? If they are, that's the baseline. And then you look for two other things. Grit. Can they hang with the tough days? And not just hang with it. Can they can they be optimistic? Again, when you're looking at the executive level, like the the the, the magnification of how they feel throughout the you know however they feel, whatever they're thinking, that's gonna that is gonna be amplified because of who they are and the amount of authority they, they have. So if they are a person that doesn't have fundamentally, they they don't have good grit. That's gonna cause problems. People will see them as a weak leader. They'll leak their stress. They'll make poor decisions, and that's bad for the organization. Mm -hmm. No matter how good their other skills are, if they don't have grit, that's going to be a tough one to be successful. And then the third is, do they have or do they have the potential for strong executive presence? Because they have to use that every single day. They have to be people who project self-confidence, who are authentic, who are unflappable in the face of being thrown a, a curveball or being, you know, someone who can bring the organization together and inspire them. And that happens when someone has executive presence and executive presence doesn't have to always be gravitas. It doesn't always have to be serious and formal. It has to be 
Do they, can they compel enthusiasm? Can they command respect? Um, and do they show up consistently with those capabilities? Mm -hmm. So those are the three things I'd look for. Competence, grit, and potential for strong executive presence. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, those three things, um, I remember years ago reading uh, the uh, the book from Sheryl Sandberg, Lean oh, In. Oh, yeah, Lean In. Mm -hmm. And I was struck, and I never thought about it, that in general, of course, there's always exception, but in general, a man will apply for a promotion if they can do 50% of the competence, and a woman will, may, will wait for 80 90% before applying. Yeah. So if this is the reality, what could women do in order not to be passed on promotion where they would actually be much better? Yes, excellent, excellent point. I think st women still are a little timid compared to their male counterparts in this area, but what they can do is ask for more responsibility, do more things proactively, demonstrate their desire to learn, and do not rely on their work to speak for themselves. That's something that a lot of women do. They, they think, I'm going to do this great job, and my boss or the people around me are going to be like, she does an amazing job. And that happens sometimes in some cases, but rarely does the person who is the hardest worker, who's not a self-promoter, rarely do they get moved up as quickly as those folks who are excellent performers, but self-promoters. Mm. And you can self-promote, you know, you can brag without being obnoxious. And so I help my folks create personal PR plans to make sure that their work is getting noticed and that they're not, you know, coming across as people who are self-absorbed. Did you say personal PR plan? Yeah, personal PR plans. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. So a personal PR plan is like marketing. You know, I mentioned that I had the, the fundamentally, that's, that's my background, marketing. It's even how I got into this. I actually teach a course called Brand Your Brilliance. And, and that is really about identifying what your talents are and making sure that the world knows what those talents are so that you can be known for them, hired for them, and trusted for them. A part of that is, so when you think about how do you market to the people that you interact with? How do you market yourself? It's what words do you use? Words are very generative. But if you use the same phrases or the same words as you're talking about yourself over time, people will start to accredit you with those, those terms. If you look and you sound like the talents that you want people to know you for, they will much more easily you know, it'll be congruent, it'll be authentic. And so all of a sudden, it doesn't take very long too to implement a personal PR plan. Um, it takes self-awareness and it takes literally a plan, but it doesn't take long to for people to start lining up in lining their thinking around what you want them to think about you. I've seen it happen over and over again. And you can see the smile on my face because mm. I love when people think I can't change people's perception of me. I'm already this old, or I'm already this many years in this company. And it takes less than six months to change how people see you. If you align in a way that's congruent with who you are. Interesting. I, you, you've been uh, working with the Woodlash Corporation. I know in, in your customer base, you have Verizon, Lexus, UCLA, Allergan, and all those mm -hmm. big names. What is going on in corporate America today? Is it true that people are resigning left and right? Oh, yes. It, they are. It's tough. It is, you know, you almost can't go a day without reading the news and seeing a story about, you know, the great resignation. Um, people are leaving. They're leaving for a variety of reasons. A lot of it is they want the flexibility to work from wherever they want to work. They want not to be working around the clock. You know, these last two years have really they've been tough on people and there's a lot of wear and tear. And so as, as, as corporations in doing what they need to do have, have dealt with the pandemic and everything that's come out of that and other things, the workloads have been a little heavier and people working from home haven't worked less. 
almost sometimes of their own volition, they've worked more. So there's a burnout. There's a, there's, there's this pressure about what is next. When are we going to get back to normal? Um, there's companies who, you know, are very, doing very well and they're being very successful and they're trying to expand, but they don't have the, the, you know, they don't have the talent to do it. So again, pressurizing their people. You've got a lot of companies who are, it's been this ping pong, things are better, things are worse, things are better, things are worse. And so that's just wear and tear. So I think people are fatigued. I think they want the flexibility and they know that there's jobs out there. So they're willing to take more risks today than any other time. Yep, makes a lot of sense. I, I, I see a difference, though, between being burnt out and, to your point, having to work much more than even before. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, it might not be the burnout, but looking at different, what, what life could be, actually. Mm -hmm. Having worked from home, don't have to go to yes. the office every day, yeah, uh, and starting to, own, to do their own business. So in the future, uh, as you are advising companies, what is the right profile and what is the right culture that they should think about implementing? Oh, uh, that's, I don't think that there's a one size fits all answer. However, I do think that that, that flexible, uh, flexible work is important. And it's interesting. It's not just people want to work from home. I've, I've had companies lose people because they became remote workforces And really what their people wanted, some of them anyway, was to be able to go to work. I mean, a lot of people don't want to work at home. You got kids running around, you got like lots of stuff. You want to get away. And I think companies are having to find that balance between when people can be allowed to work at home and then when you want to bring them back together for that camaraderie. Because if you're working for an organization, somewhere in your DNA, there's there's a draw to be part of something bigger than yourself. And so companies are having to figure out this balance. And as some companies are doing it really well and other companies are struggling. So to feel that you're part of something bigger, there's a purpose, that the, that's the culture? Well, I think all, all organizations um, are going to have a unique culture. I think that today it's really important to understand what your organization wants from the bottom up. So before, and, and yet I say that because that's true. And yet it has to also be in alignment with whoever's leading your organization, because in order for the cult, because really the culture of your organizations, you can say what you want it to be, but it's going to come from the top. So, yep. so you want to know what your people want, and then you want to make sure it aligns with how, what you can live with and what, how you can live. Absolutely. Now we, Imagine that, in, in, and that's my favorite question, uh, my friend Jason Gaynard came up with it, uh, is the champagne question. Yes. Imagine that in one year, mm -hmm. we talk again, mm -hmm. and we're celebrating something when it comes to what you're doing and the executive leaders uh, in America. What are we going to be celebrating? So if, if I, I love that question, and If we are celebrating a huge win this time next year, which would be perfect, actually, it's end of the year, it's a good time for celebration, uh, then we would be celebrating the successful um, expansion of our Executive Accelerator Program, which is something that we haven't done since before the pandemic. And that is, it's a, it's a combination live uh, and, and online program working with executives and really helping them tr transverse these five leaps and to really becoming the best versions of themselves so they can be the best leaders they can be. Awesome. Kimberly, it's been fascinating to speak with you today. Uh, if people want to get uh, in touch with you, uh, what is the best way to reach you? The best way to reach me is simply to, to send an email. It's uh, My email address is kgerber, G-E-R-B-E-R, -E at iaccelerate.com. And that's I, the letter I, accelerate, E-X-C-E-L-E-R-A-T-E.com. And I would love to hear from folks. I'd love to answer any questions and love to hear people's stories. And I, I really appreciate, Eric, this time has been a lot of fun. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Kimberly, for taking the time to speak with me today. 
Very interesting conversation. I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, if you find any value, please don't hesitate to share it with your network and share it on your social media. And if you want to reach me, go on LinkedIn or www.evenbusinessformula.com group. Thank you.